In the previous video, I talked about how we gathered limited information about a planet's surface composition using a neutron spectrometer from orbit. So, when OSIRIS-REx began scanning for potential sites to collect samples from asteroid Bennu, you might think that a neutron spectrometer was used. The thing is, OSIRIS-REx doesn't have a neutron spectrometer. Instead, it used an instrument called OSIRIS-REx Thermal Emission Spectrometer, or ODIS for short. ODIS is much more sensitive and accurate than a neutron spectrometer for detecting materials from orbit. But it can detect materials only if they're on the surface of a planet. Since OSIRIS-REx is a sample return mission, it's important to land in an area that has the type of materials you're trying to collect. It's also important that the material comes in pieces small enough that it can be collected by the machine on board the spacecraft. In the case of OSIRIS-REx, it's finding a location that has the most diversity but also pristine material composition. A location that has particles that are about 100 micrometer in size. And most importantly, it's a location that's safe to land while the sample is being collected. Otis works by detecting and analyzing infrared radiation coming from the asteroid. When the sun heats up the asteroid, some of that energy is radiated back into space as infrared radiation. But different minerals on the surface radiate different parts of the infrared spectrum at various intensity. If we were to plot the radiation intensity coming from minerals in sunlight at various infrared frequencies, we would end up with a curve that's unique to the compounds in that material. It would be the spectral signature of that mineral. And this is exactly what Otis detects. But it's not that simple. For one, the spacecraft is moving relative to the asteroid. This means all relevant frequencies we're going to sample needs to happen before the spacecraft has moved too far from the location where the frequency sweep started. To make matters worse, the sampling is necessarily done through a telescope. This area ranges from four square meters at high altitude to only four square meters at low altitude. It makes the time window to sample each area on all relevant infrared frequencies that much smaller. Otis accomplishes this by using an instrument called an interferometer, the specifics of which is called a Fourier transform interferometer. This is the device that allows the radiation from the asteroid to be scanned at various frequencies very quickly. So let's talk about how Otis turns asteroid Bennu into data. Infrared emission from Bennu is first collected by a telescope integrated into Otis. This is a Ritchie Clichon type reflecting telescope. This type of telescope is compact for a given focal length and also has less lens distortion at its edge compared to a Newtonium reflecting telescope. After the light has been collected and focused by the telescope, it is sent to the interferometer. At this point, before continuing, I'll take a step back to talk about the basic principles of an interferometer. An interferometer takes a beam of light, splits it into two beams, then reflects those beams from two separate mirrors back to the beam splitter where they're recombined to form the final beam which is then sent to the detector. The key to the functioning of this device is the distance each beam travels after they're created by the beam splitter. If the difference in distance between the paths at the time of recombination is an integer number of wavelengths, then the beams will recombine in sync or in phase. What we then have is constructive interference. However, if the difference is one half integer of the wavelength, the two beams will be completely out of sync or out of phase when they recombine, causing what we call destructive interference. They cancel each other out. Anything between the two states will have an intensity that's based on how out of phase they are. And this is the amazing part. Because the infrared wavelength we're dealing with is only about 6 to 100 micrometers, we can detect change in distance to the mirror by half that amount and that's a distance of only three micrometers. Now, 
Despite this amazing feature of the spectrometer being extremely useful, it's not the way we're going to detect minerals, but it is an important first and necessary step in that direction. When the difference in distance between the two mirrors is such that it's an integer number of a certain wavelength, then that wavelength will be in sync when both beams are recombined. Constructive interference happens and we end up with a bright spot. If, however, we leave everything the same but change the incoming wavelength to something else, the combining wave will not be in sync and they will work against each other, causing some level of destructive interference. We end up with a dim spot. We've just turned our distance measuring spectrometer into a frequency filter, and this is the key to detecting the minerals. So what Otis does is it adjusts the difference in distance between its two mirrors to make it an integer wavelength of a certain infrared wavelength we're trying to measure. Interference happens and the intensity of the center pattern is recorded. Now comes the part that makes the instrument most useful. One of the mirrors is moved ever so slightly, but enough to make the difference in distance match a different wavelength in the infrared spectrum. Interference happens, and intensity of the pattern is once again recorded. Over time, a region of the infrared spectrum is scanned for radiation coming from the planet. For Otis, this infrared band is 5.7 to a little over 100 micrometers. The mirror that moves has to move fast enough to scan the entire infrared band that's mentioned above before the spacecraft moved too far from where the scan started. To accomplish this high-speed movement, the mirror is attached to a voice coil actuator. This is an electric actuator that shares some similarity to the voice coil of a speaker. Applied voltage moves the coil in and out. In a speaker, the coil moves a cone, which then moves air, creating the sound. In Otis, the coil moves a mirror, which effectively changes the wavelength that the spectrometer is tuned to. The voice coil is fed by a 2 kHz sine wave voltage, which means that the infrared spectrum is scanned 2,000 times a second. Since the detector measures intensity over mirror distance, this data must be converted to intensity over frequency. So Fourier transform is performed on the input signal before it leaves Otis. After all, this is a Fourier transform spectrometer. We end up with a nice spectra, which can then be matched to spectral signatures of known minerals. And that's how OSIRIS-REx knows where to find the sample it needs for a return mission home. Talking about home, I'd like to thank all my viewers and subscribers for helping me grow this channel. This channel will be going to its third year in April of 2020, but 2019 was an important year. It was the year I settled on a defined topic and style. If you look at my earlier work, it was all over the place. It was science topic, but it was still all over the place. Now it's more focused. The idea is to talk about how the various technologies enable spacecraft to do what they do, and more importantly, how they actually work. If we don't know how a piece of technology actually works, we won't know its limitations. And this is key to understanding the pace of space exploration, knowing its limitation. Once again, a big thank you to all my subscribers. Let's spread a better understanding about space exploration. Share these videos if you find them useful, and I'll see you in 2020. I'm DexDFX for Reflective Layer.